This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, I'm Rekha Sharma, and I played Landry on Star Trek Discovery. You are listening to The Edge on Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Welcome, listeners, to another episode of The Edge, Trek FM's dedicated podcast to Star Trek Discovery. I am your host, Patrick Devlin, and joining me, as always, is the amazing Amy Nelson. Amy, how are you? Hi, Patrick. I am doing great. Uh, doing a lot of podcasting in between my travels, but here I am, ready to talk Discovery. Yeah, well, when you're away all the time, you have to get cram it into one weekend. I know. This is my third one today. <laughs> oh, man. I feel for you. I feel for you. I've done that before. Yeah. But we're not here to talk about your travels or how much podcasting you have to do in between them. We have a special guest today. And our special guest is a PhD researcher, Nicholas Paul Collinson. Nicholas, how are you? Hi, Patrick. Um, I'm great. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, thank you for coming. Uh, you have a special interest in this particular topic, right? Yes, that's true. So I'm, a, a, as you said, a PhD researcher. I'm specifically uh, an entomologist. So I study insects. But uh, the interesting thing about my particular project is I study uh, the interactions between insects and a specific type of a fungal organism uh, that, uh, uh, that sort of lives in the plants that they feed on. Uh, so with all of the like the mycelial network and all the cool kind of astromycology in uh, discovery, it really sort of piqued my interest. Awesome, awesome. So before we get into that though, uh, what's your history with Star Trek? Um, well, I've been watching Star Trek pretty much my entire life. So um, uh, I just turned thirty at the end of the last year, and I've. I'm pretty sure I first started watching Star Trek when I was maybe about five or six. Um, so my mum was a big fan of the original series from its, uh, I want to say original run, but it would have taken a couple of years for it to get to New Zealand where she grew up. Um, uh, and I was, a, even back then, a total space cadet. I've always been like a, a super nerd. Um, so she introduced me to um, Star Trek, you know, back then, sort of uh, mid 90s, early to mid 90s. Um, uh, and I just loved it. I think, um, you know, at the start, my favorite was um, definitely uh, Next Generation. I think I just, I loved, even even when I was really little and didn't get like the sort of bigger concepts of it, I just, I loved that kind of clean view of the future, that sort of uh, exploration and, uh, you know, doing things for the good of science and the good of uh, humanity and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it was definitely... I think that was definitely one of the things that even sort of uh, inspired me to get into science myself and uh, start studying biology and end up where I am today. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. No, it's good to hear those kind of stories that Star Trek has such profound uh, meaning to so many people. I mean, uh, one of my greatest memories is that my dad introduced me to the show and uh, he introduced me to TOS, but I'd probably say growing up that TNG was my favorite also, again, because of the clean look. Plus, Aesthetically, it looked more like what we knew, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm a little older than you, but not far, far <laughs> older than you. So, um, you know, that's kind of our age groups growing up would be TNG mm. and how it looked. Yeah, I definitely gravitate towards TNG and that idea of you know, bettering yourself and, yeah, that clean, crisp, bright future that we can have. And yeah. So I relate. Like yeah, it. I mean, it's really just the cruise ship and the stars, right? Basically, yeah. That drives, that drives Amy. What, what do they always we'll call it? That. The the Hilton in space or something like that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I kid, Amy. Um, 
But we're also not here to talk about TNG because that's not what this <laughs> show is about. Uh, but we could, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> we, we already have one of us on that show. Yes. <laughs> but uh, no, so we're here to talk about really the different organisms, you know, the mycelial network and such that existed in Star Trek Discovery and how they've used it and maybe like some of the ways that this could be a real thing or not or stuff like that, right? Yeah, and when... The first that I remember running into Nicholas on social media was when I was doing postcards for season one and Nick would make these comments. And I was just, when I read them, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so smart. And I remembered clear from season one, because you were talking about Saru and how fast he ran and his kick and like all of this, you know, science stuff. And I'm like, His name was burned into my memory ever since season one. And I'm like, we need to have him on. And then the whole thing with the fungi and the, you know, and oh my gosh. So I am very, very happy, Nick, that you have joined us. And we're going to talk about the mycelial network first. So yes. Nick, why don't you talk to us about that? Sure. All right. I've, I've kind of, yeah, I've blocked this into sort of different, uh, classes of uh, types of organisms um different uh, clades which is the one of the biological terms for a group of related organisms so yeah first with the mycelial kind of organism so the first one we have is the the actual like the space mushroom itself uh it never really gets a common name but uh this is one where it's great this is one of the first things that i remember thinking i'm probably going to like discovery was when um uh anthony rapp was doing a little thing uh when he was just announcing that he was playing the character of Stamets and he says, um, you know, oh, I've got a bit of techno babble for you. And he mentions the, the mushroom and he s- mentions its scientific name. He calls it a uh, prototaxites deliviatori. I thought, oh, they've got like Linnaean scientific names of these things. This is going to be fun. Um, and yeah, so uh, the, the piece deliviatori he says uh, they're made up of exotic matter found not only in our universe, but also a discrete subspace realm called the mycelial network. Um, and this, all of that in, in that encapsulates a lot of, uh, really interesting stuff. So, um, a little bit of, uh, kind of background mycology. So mycelia, that's a, that's a real thing. That's essentially like, uh, fungal roots. So, um, fungi are their own sort of, uh, kingdom of biology. They're not plants or animals. They're a, a separate thing again. Uh, and uh, mycelia are these sort of thin filaments that spread out under uh, a fungus, like a mushroom. So they'll spread out underground or sort of through whatever it's growing on. You know, sometimes they'll grow on other, you know, trees and plants and things. Uh, So whenever you see a fungus growing, um, uh, chances are there's going to be these small kind of fibrous network of mycelia underneath it. Um, uh, this is interesting for me because um, so one of the organisms that I study in my PhD project are um, a type of microscopic fungi called epichloe. Um, and these are what we call endophytes, uh, which means inside a plant. So uh, they're like a symbiotic microorganism that grow inside plant tissue. Uh, in this case, it's a type of ryegrass. Uh, they produce chemicals called alkaloids that give the plant resistance to insects. So uh, this is kind of like a symbiotic mutualism. Um, uh, and if we can, that actually ties into uh, some other sort of Star Trek lore, because uh, obviously we see uh, that in Deep Space Nine with the Trill, they have their symbiote, uh, which is a similar sort of thing. It's basically a, a relationship between two organisms kind of sharing the same body where both benefit. Um, so these fungi that I study, the Epichloe, uh, their mycelia spread through uh, a host plant um, they're sort of working their way between the cells. Another really interesting thing on a much larger scale. Um, so the largest single organism in the world um, is the aptly named humongous fungus. Uh, this is a massive mycelial network uh, growing under the ground. It's in, I believe, eastern Oregon, somewhere in the United States. Um, so this spreads out for sort of hundreds of square meters uh, under the ground. Um a network of uh, these mycelia and with little mushrooms protruding above the surface everywhere. So if you're looking at it, it looks like kind of individual patches of mushrooms, but because it's all connected underground, it's all 
the same organism. Each little protrusion is genetically identical. And this is kind of how I see the mycelial network in Discovery. Um, so it's a similar sort of thing. It's But instead of spreading out underground with the little mushrooms poking up above the surface, it spreads out through subspace and you have um, the little kind of mycelial fronds that grow up uh, sort of poking out into real space. Um, so like, and again, so yeah, biologically speaking, that's a bit sketchy. Like I'm, I'm not the sort of person who's going to look at uh, sort of sciencey stuff in Star Trek and be like, that's not realistic. Cause like, of course it isn't. Star Trek isn't really trying to be super like scientific realism. Um, but they do enough and with the techno babble and stuff to sort of make it work in universe. Um, That's one thing that I really have appreciated with Star Trek specifically. I mean, even the mention of time crystals and what the big to do was that for season two. And, but then there was, you know, people kept posting articles and, but there is something to this time crystal mm. thing, you know, and it's like, yeah, you start with an idea and then you exaggerate it into what science fiction, right? You exaggerate it and, and use the fun part of it and let your imagination go. And that's what makes this story so interesting that it's like, huh? Yeah. It really, you know, it started here, but then we took it here with our imagination. And I think that that's so creative. I love that about Star Trek. Yeah. Well, what I find funny is you had people screaming about the time crystals, right? And then I guess you had some screaming about the mycelial network at one point, probably, but nobody screams about the warp engines. I mean, yeah, that's that's a perversion of the science too. It, it's that's the point, right? And like you said, they do they start with a good idea, and they even name him. They even name Anthony Rapp's character Paul Stamets. Yeah, who is a mycologist? Yeah. you know, a very famous one, in fact, and. So they, they really started off with something true and then expanded outward from there till we get to this ridiculousness of a subspace network. Mm. Yeah, I, I've got to read that guy's book, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Mycelium Running, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, yeah I, I know someone who saw him speak. Cool. Once. Yeah. Um, a good friend of mine, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, this uh, kind of it was an interesting idea I had when they when they had the idea of this. So the mycelium fungus that's sort of somehow managed to evolve from a normal fungus into this protuberance into the uh, into kind of subspace subspace into this sort of uh, non corporeal thing. Um, oh, Nick, can I ask a question? Sure. So when you say that it was the largest. What did you say? The largest oh, the organism? largest f- fungal, the lar- largest organism in the world. Yeah. Okay. I really thought that I remember learning that it was the root system of like the redwood forest oh, in California. I, there is that but- too. I think there's a, there is actually like a contention between the two. I think it's like the fungus covers a greater area, but because it's just fungal mycelia, the tree, I forget what tree it is, but it's also in America somewhere. Um, yeah. it has a much greater mass volume, yeah, right, yeah, because the roots go deeper than the surface yeah. well, area, yeah. the- and the tree goes up, yeah, and also it's like the the tree itself is just sort of larger. Yeah, has I more thought mass it was it the redwood like trees in in fun. Northern California. So Amazing. okay, all right, good to know. All right, continue. So <laughs> no, I, I got a question actually sure. since. You know, we say this is not really realistic, um, but subspace itself right now isn't really realistic either, right? Yeah. So what if the fact that we started intruding on the subspace, using subspace to use warp engines or whatever, or jump to mirror universes and such, caused this whole mycelial network to even exist in the first place? We wouldn't know what the repercussions of breaking that barrier were until it was over. So it's possible that other organisms and... Like fungus and single cell organisms, I would think would be the first to make the jump after our breaking through that wall. Exactly. I think that's a really cool concept. And yeah, like you say, subspace or any of these sorts of things, you know, hyperspace and all that sort of stuff is, it's a purely theoretical sci-fi thing. So if you have that, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Um, 
Yeah, and sort of going on looking at some of the other species that we see in there, uh, I think that sort of kind of lends credence to that, I guess. Like we have the, the next one in my notes is the uh, – so the official name, even though it's only mentioned like a couple of times, is the Jacep, which is um, May Ahern. So it's that little spore that lands on Tilly and then kind of becomes her friend. I found them sort of really fascinating as well. And for all of these other ones, I've kind of made my own uh, scientific name for them all. So this one I called uh, Prototaxites Mycelio-Sapiens, uh, just because that this was a uh, sort of a sentient life form that they could actually communicate with, even though it was a very sort of, it was it was intelligent, but in a very different way to, you know, the humans and all the people on Discovery, which I found quite cool. There's this sort of, real alienness about them um i kind of like that that dis- it implies there's like a diversity of life forms in the mycelial network there's not just like the one fungus that they were looking at um uh something that i like with these uh, is um there's something kind of non-corporeal about these things existing in the mycelial network and it almost reminds me a little bit of like I can't remember the exact episode, but I know there's a next generation episode where they encounter a species that are like on the cusp of evolving into like higher beings, like non-corporeal beings. And it also happens. In Transfiguration where they call the guy John Doe and he turns into a ball of light. Uh, Is that the one? I'm going to take your word for it because you're obviously the TNG expert. That would be it. Uh, (laughs) But I would also say um, uh, like Kess in Voyager as well. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, what if the, especially something like the Jacep, that's kind of what happens when a fungal organism goes through that sort of evolutionary leap instead. Because they can kind of like uh, influence the material universe and kind of do all these sort of weird non-corporeal subspacey things. Um, uh, yeah, it's sort of very interesting. It's a concept that shows up in a lot of other sci-fi as well um some of my favorite books uh the culture series by ian and banks he calls it subliming um Mm. so yeah yeah i really like that idea and when you said it just really got me thinking like uh may and she wasn't we know that she wasn't the only one there and so yeah there are a bunch of different life forms within this mycelial network and i was like Wow, that just really is so cool to think about that they've got their own little universe, and who am I to say little, uh, yeah. that they there's this whole universe, universe, and we had one encounter who showed herself as May Ahern, you know? Yeah, uh, and I mean, it's, and it goes a bit even further than that, because obviously we can see there's quite a, uh, a diverse ecosystem in there, because um, there's also those... Uh, those trees in there as well, uh, which uh, according to Memory Alpha, um, I think maybe they mentioned this once in the show, they're called the yield trees. Uh, so these are the ones where, um, so we remember the episode, um, which one? Oh, Saints of Imperfection, obviously the one where they get Kolber back, where they actually travel into the mycelial network um, and find him in there. Uh, so the first thing that happens when he arrives is the, the Jacep start attacking him. Uh, trying to decompose them, which is kind of exactly what a kind of defense, uh, like a, the, an immune system does when something invades a body or it's like, uh, or like bees attacking something that is trying to get into their hive. So that's a very cool kind of biological mechanism there. And then he starts kind of covering himself in the bark of these trees, uh, because it's toxic to the, uh, to the Jacep. Um, and that's a really cool little thing in there. It's like a, an evolved defense mechanism. So obviously these uh, trees, whatever they are, kind of grow in the mycelial network. And they're they're in this environment, but they are toxic to other things that live there. So that kind of, to me, says that um, in the past, uh, obviously the, uh, the Jacep or some other kind of fungal organism in there were feeding on these trees. So the trees have evolved this uh, toxic bark or this toxic kind of outer coating to um uh to like defend themselves against that um and for those i and it just makes you think like there's this whole ecosystem within the mycelial network right because they're 
you know, they, like you said, they, the trees had to figure out a way to survive. I mean, that's what the whole idea is. And, you know, the Jossip are trying to survive. And so it's very interesting. So they're going to attack anything that they don't know. Like I said, that's just sort of what bacteria and what we see. So that there's a whole ecosystem in there is so cool to think about. Yeah. Well, what I also find interesting is most mushrooms have become poisonous for the same reason. And now they're using it against the spores of what, what they're telling us is the mushrooms, right? Uh, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of mushrooms and, uh, things like that. Yeah. They, have, uh, are, um, yeah, uh, poisonous. They've sort of developed, uh, various toxins, um, uh, as a defense mechanism. Um, yeah, a, a lot of um, different plants and uh, fungi and even animals have done that sort of thing. Yeah, so listeners, if you didn't notice, Nick has given Latin names for each of these things. So tell us the name for the yield trees. For the trees. yield trees, I called them, um, uh, oh, what did I call them? Uh, phytomycota. So I'm going to have to find where I put that note. They're in the oh, outline I have it. also. Yeah. It's, oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, phytomycota toxodermis. That's the one. Phytomycota toxodermis. Yes. Because uh, so phyto means plant say and it. mycota is to do with um, uh, fungi. So I sort of put those together because they they call them trees, which is usually something that we reserve for plants. Um, okay. Uh, but this is in the mycelial network. So it's not really sure what they are. And toxodermis means uh, toxic skin. Oh, okay. Now, tell us the meaning for the jossep. So, the jossep. So, these ones, I call them, uh, so, prototaxites mycelio-sapiens. So, the prototaxites, that's the same as um, uh, as the the sort of the main space fungus. So, I thought, of, often you have that two different species, but they have the same first name, the same genus name. Uh, best example of that is uh, the different sort of early species of hominids so we are homo sapiens neanderthal we're homo neanderthalus it's so we're both of the same genus but sort of different species splitting off from that uh so that to me i thought they are both quite similar sort of fungal spore organisms they just um are quite closely related and yes yeah, so mycelio sapiens um so sapiens uh, it's like homo sapiens it means uh wise i believe it's basically use especially it's used a lot in um uh any sort of science fiction fantasy things as the kind of species name of anything that is uh sentient or sapient and again the mycelio is uh like mycelium uh fungi so we've talked about the mycelial network now but the the way in which we started to i say we but we're talking about you know discovery started to realize how to navigate this was by use of a tardigrade now, tardigrades are real things in, in the world, um, which I guarantee you, after that first episode, Google had like a million hits <laughs> on what they were. But It was trending. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was. Ironically, I had just heard about it recently before, like in an article on Facebook or something. But um, So I actually knew what it was, and then when it was massive, it was like, well, that's a little weird. So... Uh, First, do you you want to run down like what the what an actual tardigrade is, uh, abs- and then how they used it here? Yeah, absolutely. I actually think tardigrades are super cool. So I knew about them uh, a little bit beforehand as well. Um, yeah, they've definitely been a little thing of uh, uh, like a few months, maybe a year before on Facebook. There'd been a lot of videos going around of someone who done animations of sort of what they look like. So yeah, real tardigrades there is sort of a uh, really fascinating div- and. Uh, diverse group that um so they live in moist conditions um so uh they're also known as uh water bears um and also sometimes i think i've heard people call them moss piglets um because uh, they're quite common in kind of moss in kind of like kind of damp mossy areas like that um so and apparently very common in these so if you live anywhere with a lot of kind of moss around on trees or anything it's quite likely that there might be some living in it um, oh, they would love my backyard. Mine too, yeah. I can't get any grass, but I got tons of moss. <laughs> um, so, yeah, these kind of damp conditions, that's their favored conditions. That's that's where they thrive. 
Um, but the cool thing about tardigrades is they can survive uh, very, very harsh extremes. This is, includes like high temperatures and drought. Even um, some have been sent up into space, like on little panels on probes, and some of them have survived even that. Um, this, a lot of people hear this and they call them extremophiles. Technically speaking, they're not because an extremophile is something that sort of thrives in extreme conditions. What tardigrades do, um, and real tardigrades, and this is something that they showed in Discovery as well, which was really cool, is so when they have to survive through really harsh conditions, they kind of go into a internal stasis and they curl up into a thing called a tun, it's spelled T-U-N. Uh, and this is exactly what we see the tardigrade do in Discovery. It, they just sort of expand most of their moisture and just sort of curl up into a ball and harden. Um, and then they can sort of uh, resaturate and sort of unfurl out of that when conditions improve. Um, uh, and yeah, so the Discovery Tardigrade does exactly this. Uh, so when they've overexerted it, they've been using it to pilot the spore drive um, and it's just getting... Uh, it's just having this sort of extreme pressure placed on it and eventually it just decides to kind of curl up on itself and they can't sort of break it open or get into it or do anything with it. Uh, so like not- a potato bug. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is that is that one of the, the many, little- many names for the little <laughs> yes. like pill bugs? I- yeah, the- yeah. I we call them in Utah potato bugs. What do you call them, Patrick? I don't know what we're talking about. They're the little tiny, like uh, a yeah, uh, armadillo, but little yes, tiny, and little, they curl little gray up. things that curl up. Yes, those are. I'm they're in the New York. cutest we don't things. Have, I we would don't pick have them. them up and roll them around in my hand. They're the, oh, they're yeah, the yeah, best yeah, yeah. pet for little. They're miserable and they they want to be left alone. And there you are rolling them around in your <laughs> yep, hand like exactly. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. So over here we call them um, slaters, and sometimes slaters. I think I've heard people call them butchy boys. That might just be like a little schoolyard name. Yeah. So there's like potato, but pota- we call them potato bugs. I have no idea why. Um, but yeah, there's different names. It seems to be what region that's yeah. a giveaway as to what region you're from. That's really weird. They're quite interesting. They're, um, I've they're actually, never seen this thing. They're actually crustaceans and not um, uh, insects. Really? Yeah. Pat, are you looking it up? <laughs> I am. And I've never seen this thing. A potato bug. There it is. Armadillidum dium vulgar. Common pill bug, potato bug. Yeah, pill, pill bug. That sounds right. Yeah. Pill wood loose, roly poly. I've heard the yes, word roly poly. Roly-poly. We don't use it for yeah. these. We don't use it for these. <laughs> what do you call them? The, the ones we have are white. White? They come in yeah, they're like, colors. I, Sometimes they maybe, can Maybe it's the same thing and mine are just white. <laughs> Cool. I don't oh know. Oh my what? gosh, it's- that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, there we go. Well, that's, I mean, uh, quite a few um, small creatures do that kind of rolling up as a defense mechanism. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a uh, convergent evolution, lots of different organisms that kind of converge on the same strategy for dealing with something. Well, like you were saying, though, the thing I find that the most interesting is they actually used, for the tardigrade, they actually used the exact way it would defend itself in that situation. Yeah. If it were real. Now, they don't explain to you that real tardigrades are microscopic, but um, it is cool that it does that. It sheds all its water. And then when they release it, it wakes up and takes off. Yeah. So, they put it back into its uh, its kind of uh, favored environment, um, sort of where it likes to be. Um and exactly, it it wakes up, it uncurls, and then it sort of zaps itself off into the into the mycelium. Yeah. So now I did hear a criticism of that in that it wouldn't be able to find water in space. Yeah. But my answer to that was, but it was connected to the mycelium network where there would be water. Yeah, I would say ah. that 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 kind of uh, that covers that quite nicely. You know, it's again we're talking about sort of. Uh, we're talking about kind of animal things living in the vacuum of space, which is always going to be a bit more of a of a sci-fi kind of far-fetched thing than than real life. That's um, it kind of quite nicely brings us into the the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Oh, well, first of all, for the uh, if you want the the scientific the name, name for the uh, for the tardigrade, I called it the um, where did I put it? So yeah, I went with a. Uh, 
Astra Tardigrada Prototaxidae. Um, often you will have, uh, so Astra Tardigrada is space tardigrade. That's pretty simple. And uh, I wanted to use Prototaxidae for the uh, species name there, just because quite often if you have one type of organism living on or around another, um, you'll sort of use the, it, its species name will sort of reflect the genus of the one that it lives on. Uh, example is one of the insects that I study is uh, a type of aphid called Repelosiphum padi. The padi comes from uh, Prunus padus, which is the uh, bird cherry tree, which is the uh, plant that it lives on. Hmm. Um, so from that, um, yeah, so I guess the next one I want to talk about. So I'm going to move on to the, the other, uh, Cosmozoan I have, uh, which is, so the other like space born life form, which is of course the space whale. Um, the space whale I decided to call, uh, so they call it the Gormaganda, which I decided, uh, that's a pretty good name in itself. That's a good one to be its, uh, genus name. Uh, so this one I called the Gormaganda Leguinii. Uh, Leguinii doesn't have anything to do with the uh, animal itself. It's just occasionally if you, if someone discovers something, they get to name it whatever they want. Um, uh, or if you're just the one doing the naming. So I decided to name this one after uh, my favorite author, which is Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, also because uh, there are a couple of, I believe there was a prehistoric sort of giant sperm whale, which has the uh, scientific name of uh, Leviathan Melvillii named after Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick. So I thought that kind of fits. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, as I, I think I sort of alluded to this with a tardigrade, but even more so with this. So a space-dwelling kind of fleshy life form, it's as cool as it looks. That's one of the things that is very improbable um, in this whole sort of uh, Star Trek science-y stuff. Um, uh, if, if some kind of... Uh, animal kind of life form were to exist in space it's probably more likely it would have some kind of a uh, hard exoskeleton to um, protect it from the vacuum and radiation uh interesting thing with the space whale that i found so in the real world whales are adapted to uh living in really high pressures in the deep ocean so especially the sperm whale that they can dive up to uh uh 2250 meters um, below the surface. So that's uh, about 7,300 feet. Um, and they go down there looking for giant squid to eat. Um, so they can withstand a lot of kind of pressure from the outside pushing in. But also because they're underwater, it's sort of, they're buoyant. So they don't have to actually support that much of their own weight. Uh, which is why when uh, whales like that get beached, uh, it's really terrible. Not just because they're out of the water and they're hot and they're drying out um also especially the larger ones literally get sort of crushed under their own weight mm. that's something that i thought you know with the gormaganda when they beam it into the shuttle bay you'd almost expect the exact opposite effect so this is something that is completely adapted to living in the vacuum of space with sort of you know zero gravity zero kind of external pressure environment so it's entirely evolved to kind of keeping its own pressure internal and keeping that in suddenly you put that in the shuttle bay of a starship where presumably they have kind of earth gravity and atmospheric pressure you'd expect something like that to be kind of to instantly implode under all of that um uh sudden gravity and pressure uh, oh, this is making me sad. I'm really feeling for this Gormagander. I know. Well, this is why it, I think... It died anyway. It's not like it survived any of this. So how are you more sad now? I think I think they... I don't know. I don't know. They if blew it, it up from the inside. Do they? No, I think that, I think they let it out. I, he blows his way out of it. It depends on which time he, loop you're looking in. Yeah. <laughs> he works out of... That's... Okay, that's one point that I do need to bring up. It's not so much related to biology, but this is definitely something that my uh, my partner brought up when we were watching it. Why didn't they scan it when they beamed it on board? <laughs> How did right. they not know that there was a spaceship inside with a man in it? <laughs> anyway, um, so I do think there's, I mean, there's a pretty easy way to kind of wangle our way around this where we could say that, oh, they probably erected some kind of s s uh, integrity field around it or a little pocket of uh, of zero gravity or something like that. Um 
Yeah, there's no way around it because, because Harry Mudd then, comes walking, yeah, he goes walking out. Right, out of it and then it, he would have died. And yeah. it, sort, it sort of <laughs> compresses a bit when it instantly appears on the deck, yeah. Maybe they're just yeah. very tough. That could be. Um, <laughs> it could have been creating its own atmosphere around itself. Yeah, sure. Think of it like a torpedo, because that's how torpedoes fly through water. <gasps> that's mm. right. It's... um. Cavitation. They create an air pocket yeah. so that they're not actually slowed down by the water. I get it. It's ridiculously yeah. overthinking this, but it's the only thing that makes it make sense when it lands on the deck that it doesn't somehow implode. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and look, this is another thing. So I've I've seen a few things, few people talking about it, saying, "Oh, you know, spaceborne life forms is you know really not the sort of thing that can exist." Um, but I love it in Star Trek, and we've had it before. You know, like we had uh, the the star jellies in Encounter at Farpoint. Yes, and in Galaxy's Child, that's the one that reminds me most the space well, the one where it latches onto the Enterprise. Oh, yeah, it, and it thinks it the Enterprise is its birth. mum. Yeah. Yes, and gives you also birth the crystalline the entity. Mm. Yeah. But that's not right. a jelly substance like you were saying. No, it's but not, but it's a it life a form life in space. Form, yeah. But it does yes. it does fit more in the that's the kind of life form you would expect to see yeah. if there were life in space would be something like a quartz yeah, crystal. Yeah, something with that sort of hard or a sort of hard exterior. If you want to um jump franchises, there's the 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 Leviathan ship uh Moya in Farscape, which is like a really yes. cool concept. Um Well, we did, if you go back, listeners, and take a listen to Earl Grey, um, I'm going to see if I can come up, but we did have an entire episode on space uh, life Entities. forms out there. Life forms, you like the <laughs> life forms. Yeah. <laughs> Where but, are you? Do, 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 do. But I, in my opinion, that that was very good, but in my opinion, if you're trying to figure out how they exist in space, you're you're kind of like... You know, you're you're missing the point. A little bit, yeah. Of the show, the show's not. They're not. This is not an explanation of theoretical physics. It's, it's, it's something more than that. And this is just a vehicle they're using. And sometimes it works out really cool, and sometimes it doesn't. I think these ones that we're talking about worked out really well. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't walk away going, "Oh, that's not true." A whale in space? Come on. Yeah. I mean, we had a movie where they brought whales back from the 1990s <laughs> to to TOS or whatever year they went back to. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. The great big whale whale probe coming in and um, and messing everything yeah, up. Yeah, destroying everything. Oh, so, that was cool. Um, which is one of my favorite, and I got to see a stage reading of that. Cool. That was really cool. That would have been awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so ultimately, yeah, like we say, um, all of this is kind of far-fetched, but I love the way that they portray it in um, Star Trek, especially in Discovery with the Gormaganda. As much as it, it only little features a little bit in that episode, I really do love that... Um, there's that little bit where they mention that there's this sort of uh, conservation directive that they have to take it to like a sanctuary world because they're an endangered species, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's um, I think that's all I've got about the the Gormaganda. I just think it's a it's a cool concept. I always like uh, when Star Trek does like weird big space life forms. Yes, agreed. So, um, another interesting life form that, which is, uh, Amy alluded to earlier with your comment about Saru are the Kelpians. Yes. Now, to me, I hear that word. I think something that lives in the ocean, by the way. And everyone looks at me like I'm crazy when I say that, but kelp is in the ocean. Well, yeah. And, um, and then we see in season two or the short trek of them actually, actually harvesting taking kelp. up the kelp from the sea. I was like, yes. oh, really? Um, well, yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if the, cause the Kelpie is a, is a sort of a, it's a water creature. It's sort of a horse-like water creature, a mythical creature from a uh, Scottish and Celtic mythology. So there huh. might be some connection there in terms of the naming of them. Um, yeah. So in terms of names of these ones, I went quite simple. I went with a uh, Kelpa sapiens, um, Again, because uh, sapiens, they are wise, they are sentient creatures. Um, and that's something I, I have always kind of liked. Uh, I really like the idea of a, this a sapient species that evolves from like a herding or like a prey species. Even though we find out later on that, that, that the Kelpians weren't originally prey, that was still something that kind of 
grabbed me at the start. Uh, it reminded me from, um, I don't know if either of you would know if the, uh, there's like a kind of young adult or like early reader science fiction book series called Animorphs that I read when I was a kid. And I absolutely loved them. And there were an alien species in those called the Andalites who are sort of kind of similar. They looked very different. They were kind of like purple centaurs with scorpion tails. And they evolved from sort of a grazing herd animal. And they evolved their intelligence, their sentience, as a way to kind of defend from predators. You def- compare that to us, and we are our, the only kind of example that we know in the real world of this kind of thing. So we kind of evolved from both predators and prey. You know, we were kind of sitting in the middle of the, of the food web. Um, but sort of as we evolved, we kind of became... Uh, sort of more higher level uh, predators uh, and our sapience we the leading theory at least is that we evolved this to help sort of coordinate hunts amongst groups of, of hunter gatherers um, so to think of a species that evolves the same same sort of intelligence but from a completely different starting point to kind of coordinate running away from predators instead of being a predator, I think is kind of very fascinating. Um, yeah. And sort of, so I would say, I'm sorry to cut you off, no, but sure. I would say Kelpians are actually very much like us because before they, um, and they, they call it the force of evolution of them, but it, it's, it's really a force maturity of them. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I have children and babies, you know? Yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, like children cool. and babies can't defend themselves. Right, so they need parents and uh, other adults to do the defending. From I mean, now we've built houses and stuff, but long before we yeah. had this, we were worried about you know if you lived in a jungle, you were worried about jungle animals coming against you. If you lived on a plane, you were worried about water buffalo trampling your people. Yeah, you know. But we learned how to do that, and I that's how I see the Kelpians as they were forced to be a prey species, but they were more like humans. They were just so much better at it once they got older. Yeah. And they were they were obviously more violent, so they were trying they were knocking out the baul. So the baul forced them back the other way. Yeah. But I think the baul were attacking them as children, possibly. Mm. Yeah, there's a there's a kind of a lot to dig into there, and I I hope that we somehow get more exploration of that. You know, depending on sort of what series we get in the future. Um. Uh. But yeah, in the actual, I. I really love the sort of the portrayal of Saru's biology. I mean, going back to one of the, the first comment of mine that you mentioned, Amy, about Saru's kind of strength and his running speed and that sort of stuff. So that that is similar to what we see in sort of antelope and herd animals like that. So he's got these sort of long, he's very sort of tall and thin and, and lithe, and he's got these sort of long, quite uh, deer-like legs. And he's got the kind of running, sort of very fast running gait of a, I think at the time when I made that comment, I may have even looked up the running top running speed of like an antelope or something, and it was pretty yeah, comparable. Um, and he's got that kick as well, which I um, I haven't personally, but my partner uh, spent a lot of time around horses, and they have a, a nasty kick. Um, so a lot of these sorts of um, kind of herding animals evolve these sorts of uh, things as a as a defense to kick anything that's behind them. So that made a lot of sense from that point of view. Um, yeah, I've spent some time around horses. The one place you don't want to be behind, behind them. them. Absolutely, yeah. I know, that's I'd rather always get run over. scared me because I also rode horses uh, when I was in middle school. And so, yep, you always are like tapping yep. their you back sure end. That- it's like, here I am. I'm not scaring you. I'm right here. Don't <laughs> kick me, please. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, there was one thing. This is uh, an interesting thing that we sort of, uh, saw at the start. Um, so one thing that a lot of these uh, prey animals have um, or herding animals um, is they have their eyes on the sides of their heads because that gives them better peripheral um, vision. Whereas uh, things like us, like primates or um, predators like cats and wolves have their eyes a bit closer to the front of their head because that gives you binocular vision. So it gives you better depth perception so you can judge when you're pouncing on prey or throwing a spear at prey. Um, and that's that sort of trade-off for, uh, you know, defense versus offense. Um, so when I f- we first saw the Kelpians and the, he was saying, oh, we've evolved from prey species. 
So both of our first comment was, oh, hang on, if they were prey, they should have the eyes on the side. So I think it's kind of interesting that we then sort of go on and we figure out that that's not quite where their species comes from. Um, so it kind of does make more sense for have them to have the eyes on the front. Again, I mean, they have the eyes on the front because the, because we're because human. we're human and there's, it's a human man in a suit. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it is interesting that we kind of pick up this story in the process of them evolving into prey species. Yeah. So without our without you know um, the discovery um, interfering. Uh, I'm going to use a really little number. So like a million years from now, maybe their eyes would have rotated closer to the back of their head. If they never experienced var high. Right. Which none of them were anymore. You know what I mean? So they were, you know, we don't know how long they've had that kick for. It could have just been the last million years, which would be an insignificant amount of time in evolution of an animal, you know? So, um, I I just find it interesting because that, that's a way you can explain off the, the eyes being in the wrong place without even worrying about that is that this was actually mid evolution. Yeah. And uh, so they, the, the ganglia came first cause it was a warning system. Maybe they didn't have that. Well, I guess they always had it. They, they just, ne- they, it would go away when they mature, yeah. you know? So, but now it was a permanent fixture because they weren't being allowed to mature. Exactly. I mean, it kind of goes into what you mentioned before that, that, that is kind of the, the, almost the child stage. So that's, uh, let me go ahead to that because um, what do we have? Yeah, so that's and uh, yeah, you mentioned this as well. They are um, they call it their next stage of their evolution, which is that's not it. I I sort of put down that that's it's only really evolution in the uh, in the Pokemon sense. You know, one one creature turning into another. I right. love that. It's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you just named this. <laughs> <laughs> wow cool okay um yeah it's uh i would call it metamorphosis and uh, yeah because it's much similar to what we actually see a lot of insects go through you know insects have uh instars as uh, larvae or nymphs before they change into the adult and usually when they do that they molt their outer skin uh or you know caterpillars will form a cocoon and then turn into a, a butterfly or a moth um, and that's the sort of thing that we're seeing is they don't sort of cocoon themselves, but they kind of go through this quite rapid change, you know, this process in themselves. And presumably every individual Kelpian would do that. So if, um, you know, all of the Kelpians on Kamenar now have gone through the, um, the Vaharai, any new young ones would still be, you know, the actual, you know, larval or uh, i guess you'd say juvenile form they'd have the threat ganglia and then they reach whatever the specific age is um uh and then they would go through the process and then sort of grow the the spiky things so i have a couple questions actually to ask and my first one goes to what you were just saying is there species on this earth that go through this metamorphosis at different ages like you said you know i've seen it was a fun little project in elementary school you know starting with the little beetle and it makes a cocoon and then we see it go to a butterfly like that's going to be a pretty consistent time frame of watching that whereas when we see saru and the kelpians they never knew exactly when vahari would take place like some of them were young some of them were older so is there an example of an animal going through a metamorphosis at different stages, at different times, periods in their life? Um, yes, sort of. Um, so basically, in, in so the only times we really see this sort of thing are um, uh, invertebrates. So it's the... Um, arthropods, which is sort of insects and crustaceans and those sorts of things, and, and some other sort of um, similar things like that. Um, mostly because they have this hard exoskeleton, so it can't really grow with them. So they need to sort of peel it off. And then you have the the newer life sort of uh, life stage comes out of that. When that happens can be influenced by the conditions they live in. Um, mm-hmm. This kind of goes back to the project that I've been working on. Um, so when I grow uh, little aphids on 
different seedlings of ryegrass. Um, it depending on what type of uh, endophyte, what type of little fungus the uh, ryegrass is infected with, it can take them longer to um, progress through the different life stages. Um, uh, so it's kind of dependent on diet and nutrition. So if I have one on our on the control treatment, so that's the one that doesn't have any uh, endophyte, doesn't have anything like that. It's uh, just growing on that, growing perfectly happily uh, the way it would just out on regular ones in the wild. It'll take it, you know, roughly a week to get from being newly born to the adult stage where it can start reproducing. Any of the ones on other treatments, um, a few of them, it would take them a little bit longer. So, yes, there are examples of uh, animals going through these stages uh, at different rates. It is almost always dependent on their nutrition. That's why when you have, you know, caterpillars, uh, they are just eating machines. They just eat and eat and eat and eat until they are large enough and they have all the sort of stored fat and energy to go through that metamorphosis process. So, but also to answer your question, uh, Amy, um, from a different perspective, um, humans go from, bio biologically speaking, from children to adults or full maturity at slightly different rates, right? Because, I mean, well, puberty is what you're talking about, yeah? Right. So, and I, I was going to say the word eventually, but I was definitely beating around the bush on that one but uh but no but like you'll you'll have some younger some older um you know and you even outwardly seeing it like when uh, guys start growing beards mm -hmm. would change some could grow them earlier than others and and these things happen so i mean it's not quite the same thing but you know if we're just talking about getting to maturity i think the more complex of an organism you are the more leeway there is i'm not a scientist however so i'm just guessing here but uh there's, you know, the more complex you are, obviously, the the harder it is for all your cells to get in line for it, right? And that's a terrible way of explaining it, but I think it fits because single cell organisms can change quite rapidly compared to a multi cell yeah. organism or a multi organ organism. Yeah. And that that's funny. I can uh, remember <laughs> my friend in high school, and we gave him such a hard time because he was getting gray hair. Like not just one or two. He was literally getting gray hair in high school. Wow. Love oh, it. I have I have friends Love that you, have full heads. <laughs> full heads of gray hair by the end of high school. And now, and I made fun of them all the time, and now I'm getting punishment because if you see this beard, <laughs> it's all gray. It's all gray. Yeah. But this isn't because of evolution. This is because I have children and a wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everyone knows, that's what causes this. Uh, so, Nick, I have another question for you. Um, so, the threat ganglia is pre Vahari. And then it turns into like this attack. Do we see anything similar like that in our I earthly? was trying to think of that. Because um, that seems pretty weird. Because I, I was thinking like, well, we lose our wisdom teeth, but we don't get more, you know, meat we don't tearing fangs, teeth in yeah. replace. Yeah. yeah, no. And we really only lose them because we're actually evolving out of them, not into them. Um, I mean, it is similar, though, to butterflies getting their wings. They don't lose necessarily anything, but they grow something Yeah, new. and well, butterflies are an interesting example because they do... So their diet and sort of way of living changes drastically. So a caterpillar has uh, sort of chewing mouth parts, and it eats the, the flesh of the leaves of trees. And it just sort of chews through them and gets all the nutrients from that that it can. When it metamorphoses and becomes the butterfly or the moth, um, so they have a proboscis. They have this sort of long sucking tube, which they use for feeding on plant nectar. I was trying to think of any examples that have that more sort of predatory thing. Um, hmm. Dragonflies are kind of interesting, but it's a little bit the other way around. So a dragonfly nymph, um, which is their, uh, their juvenile stage, they're aquatic. They live in the water and they have sort of extending um, grabbing mouth parts. It's almost like the that sort of internal extra mouth thing that the, the xenomorph from Alien films has. Um, oh, wow. And they are voracious predators in like ponds and streams where they breed. And then uh, adult dragonflies, they are still carnivores. They're still predators. 
but they sort of hunt in a very different manner and they don't have those sort of extending mouth parts anymore. Huh. They're also a great indication of when you should go fishing. Yes. I, I don't fish, but a lot of them I can lakes. imagine. If there are lots of... If you see a lot of them over the lake, start throwing in and you're going to get if there some are, fish. Yeah, if there are a lot of insects <laughs> around, there's going to be a lot of fish there. <laughs> yep. Um... Yeah, I think that's... I did have a couple of notes. So there was one interesting thing. So before we knew the whole story of the Kelpians, I had this interesting concept where, you know, Saru's been talking in the past about how they were a prey species. But then when we actually see them in uh, that short trek in uh, The Farthest Star, it's much more as if they're being farmed than hunted. At that time, I thought, oh, maybe maybe the priests of the Kelpians sort of struck this deal with the Ba'ul. You know, they used to be prey that were just sort of hunted and wiped out and eventually they're like no we can we can strike this deal you know we just sacrifice a few of us to you every whenever and in return you know you won't bother us for the rest of the time and we can build little villages and harvest our kelp and stuff when that which is what happened it's eventually yeah and they kind of um basically domestic that always themselves. bothered me yeah yeah and that bothered me because Saru shouldn't think of himself as a prey species then, right? Yeah, and there's that, there is that one line, I think it's in the first episode, where he says, we are your livestock of old. But aside right. from that, he, he, yeah, he keeps saying, you know, we are we're prey species. We were, we were preyed upon. So it's- right, and even livestock of old, when I hear that line, what I think of is like, um, and this is a very American uh, uh, analogy, but when like the Native Americans would cross the plains and, and attack the buffalo. Yeah. They didn't herd them into a pen. They just tracked them and took them in. That's what I thought of as livestock of old. It makes more sense mm. being that they, they are just treated like livestock, period, yeah. on a farm somewhere. You know, like My best friend's grandfather owned cows. He didn't actually kill them or anything he just liked owning cows it was a hobby okay. of his but so he but it was still like you know a large farm with different gated areas and different i don't know different grasses i guess or whatever they'd feed on this grass for a couple months and then feed on that grass and whatever but see that's kind of how the kelpians seemed to me you know like yeah they sort of they were just herded, yeah, herded as opposed to uh hunted yeah, yep. I went uh, actually twice in my life living out here in the West. You can actually go to these working, you know, ranches. And the last one I went to was uh, 2008, 17, and went up to Idaho. And I helped them move the herd to a different part of the mountain up in Idaho. It was so much fun. Oh, <laughs> but yep, cool. I was literally herding them. <laughs> Yeah, I did that with like eight cows, old cows. <laughs> was, um, uh, a little different, like I said, because these were like his pets, yeah. really. And he had one really old horse. Like the horse was, by the time I had met him, it was so old, like even children couldn't ride him anymore. Oh, yeah. No, but, this um, was, we were four strong, me, my brother, and then the two ranch hands. And there was like multiple herds. I, I would say about 50 head. It was that's wow, awesome. That's yeah, cool. it was cool. That's awesome. The only claim to fame for the one I went to is, um, I don't know if you know of it, but you know uh, the concert Woodstock? Oh, yeah. It was in the same town as the original Woodstock. That's pretty cool. So the weekend, I, the first weekend I ever went up there, actually, they were doing a festival for Woodstock at the old camp, you know, at the old, because that was a farm. Cool. Woodstock was held yeah. on a farm. Right. In upstate yeah, New York. I, and uh, nice. it was cool. But that had nothing to do with this. I just like Oh, that's cool. I, it's, <laughs> We've it's gone really on a tangent. About it. That's great. That's all right. We haven't gone on many this time. Yeah. So. I know. No, I've got, uh, obviously, as I said, so my, my project, I'm an agricultural entomologist. So I'm doing my, my PhD through uh, the the state government's uh, agriculture division. So I actually get to meet quite a few uh, farmers and go out to rural areas. And I did quite a bit of a work with a, a dairy farmer who lives nearby. I would go out and sort of do try to collect aphids and stuff from his fields and sort of look at the grass and stuff. And yeah, yeah he got a bunch of cows. He's got lovely big black and white Holsteins. He sort of took me around, showed me around all where they do the milking and everything. It's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I live in a big city, and uh, so I don't get to yeah. see anything like that around here at all. Uh, in fact, I just went past. I saw when I was a kid, there was one farm left in New York City's limits. Oh wow! And uh, it did all kids programs, and I just drove by it 
yesterday on my way home and it shut down years ago and like the fence is like half broken mm. and it's overgrown and the building's over which is really sad because I remember as a kid going there and like you know picking lettuce or carrots or whatever they were farming at the time it wasn't an animal farm but it was a farm it was the only one left yeah. in New York City's limits yeah um, but that and that was kind of sad to me to see that's gone no, that's mm. um, yeah my grandparents uh, were farmers and well literally my grandpa was a farmer and employed majority of kids back in the day in the small town of Centerville, Utah. And, you know, going through all of his orchards and oh, his farmland. And now, you know, they've had to sell and it's all developed and houses. And it's like, there's one tree that oh. they kept, you know, and it's like, <gasps> That's the tree, and you know, but yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. But that's, I mean, that's like where I live. Um, we these homes are called Morton Homes. Uh, Amy's been to my home, and it, when she when she went down the block, she saw every house looks the same. Yes. Well, this was Morton's. This was Morton's farm, and he sold it off piece by piece, or he sold it off to a developer who pieced it out and put all these homes. Yeah. Everywhere. You yeah, know? that's my grandma. Although I think he became the developer, but. Mm. So he made all the money on it, but whatever. I mean, you know, but that's what happens to a lot of these farms because it's just, I don't, I, I don't know. Our government pays people to stop growing things. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Similar sort of things are happening around. I mean, Melbourne is great, especially sort of the, the Northeast is a lot of it's, it's quite a big city. Um, not sort of comparable to like New York, but it's sort of. Decent sized city, but you drive for sort of less than an hour from the city center in the right direction. And you're practically in the country, which is sort of where I am, which is lovely. Yeah, I'm nowhere near that. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go at least two hours to get to a country like area. Yeah, and uh, I guess upstate maybe less, but but even then, it, it's just our suburbs are not really suburbs here in New York. Yeah, like, like I, mean, I would be considered the suburbs, and Amy can tell you my next door neighbor, I can. If I trip, I land on their house. Yep. Yeah. You know, that's, still that's very the suburbs city. Here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she also knows that Manhattan is much bigger and <laughs> greater than my neighborhood, too. Mm. But, uh, but see, I've always, I love the country style. That, I don't know. I grew up and lived in a big city my whole life, but I'd much rather be out on a farm or really where I love to be is up in the mountains somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that'd be lovely. Uh, my wife, however, thinks it's cold at 75 degrees, so there's no way I'm getting her to the top of a mountain. Okay. I know. I love so, your wife. So, I know. So I've had to, so does Brandon. She makes fun of me on our podcast all the time. Um, so unfortunately, I'm going to Florida after this, but that's a whole other story. Okay. I just did a quick, quick uh, conversion. And yeah, like even I would not yet consider 75 to be cold. Getting there. Aus oh, Australians yeah, have a Celsius, very, sorry. very. <laughs> what is it? Was it twenty three point eight? Twenty three point eight Celsius. That's still nice and warm. Yeah, not in my <laughs> house. <laughs> I'd have to go to like thirty, thirty five. I like the heat. I like being warm, but like <laughs> above thirty five is is getting a bit too much. Like. It, that is, yeah. Are you, Even for 35, me. But I enjoy it because I live it here and I'm actually living it right now because we are in summer in Las Ooh, Vegas. Oh, that'd be nasty. What's, what is it? Double it and add 30, right? 32? Is that what it is? 35, 35 is 70 plus 32 is 100. It'd be around 100, I think. Like you get, we. All right, so probably 30, 60 plus 30, 90. Yeah, she needs, I don't know, whatever 80 is. Uh, I guess I'd be like 29 yep, or whatever. thereabouts. That, that's what she that's, wants, 80 or above. Wow. <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool so should we do our final thoughts i think so um, yeah yeah sure so uh nick you start with yours yeah all right well i've kind of just said so the thing i love is uh star trek's always had this sort of uh, a history of like weird science and alien biology it's never been very like realistic you know in quotation marks uh but it's always been really cool uh, and Discovery continues this tradition really well. Uh, I think more so than some previous series, I think it is really able to show things that feel a bit more truly alien. Like to me, Saru is a really good example of this. Um, he feels more alien to me than sort of Spock or Worf or like say Neelix or Phlox used to. Um, uh, and just like the makeup and the writing and uh, especially Doug Jones's perf uh, performance his mannerisms give it's just this really good sense of alienness, uh, but still enough familiarity for us to empathize with them. Um, 
and like that, you know, we've got the mycelial network and all its sort of associated denizens. It all feels very alien, but just like a little bit familiar. Um, uh, and like, of course, it's not super like scientifically accurate, but Star Trek's always played it fast and loose with science. And what matters is it feels real when you're watching it in the moment. Um, and most of all, to me, it's obvious that the writers have a real love for uh, all this kind of strange alien biology uh, and they also have like a good knowledge of where it comes from and they've just kind of taken that and really rolled with it and turned it into something really interesting and cool um a lot of thought has been put into like fleshing out these species and uh giving them like little small details that make the world feel really real and deep uh amy would you like to give yours next yeah, you know, Nick, I didn't this want to follow is, that. <laughs> I know. How do you follow that? <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you, Nick. And I'm so glad that you agreed to come on because, you know, just even talking about these three specific areas, you know, related to especially your wheelhouse has definitely I've learned so much by just listening to you talk and how you name things totally takes me back to elementary school and trying to learn all of this stuff and deciding this is why I'm not a scientist. I'm a mathematician because this is just way yeah. above my. Don't, don't ask me to talk here. maths. I even have to do, <laughs> I have to do all, a lot of statistics has to be done for my project. I don't do that. Right. I outsource it to my oh, biometrician <laughs> friend. <that> <laughs> But, you know, and like we've talked about, like, it's what Star Trek does so well is take an idea that's based in reality, that's based in the science, in the scientific world, and then exaggerates them to this fiction, right? The science fiction. And it helps. I just, I'm in so much awe of the creativity that goes into this of even thinking about, okay, here's, you know, Stamets and talking about mycelium. And then now we have the spore drive and they're traveling through this. Like, seriously, who thinks of this stuff? This is so amazing. And that there is grounded, pun intended, really in real life science. That's what is so wonderful about it. And to hear you describe and, you know, go at length with the biology of it all. I'm just so very, very happy that you're here. And this has been amazing. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. So my, um, my final thoughts are uh, one, this, now that we've talked about this in this, in these terms, it's, it's very, uh, Similar Star Trek is very similar to comedy, but backwards. Comedy takes something that's real and exaggerates one aspect of it to such a ridiculous proportion that it's funny. Whereas this takes one aspect and exaggerates all the other parts of it to make it seem more scientific, oh, right? Yeah. Um, which is not a word, but <laughs> it's the exact opposite of of, of comedy. And um, and I just made up a word too, so I can. <laughs> yay. Um, <laughs> But no, uh, I love the fact that you named them and they sound exactly like what I would expect things like this to sound like in, in Latin, you know, which is great. Um, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, small story real quick. I actually had to get a tutor for biology in high school, uh, which is weird because I love science and I just was terrible at it at first. Part of that, I think, was my teacher, but that's another story, too. And um, so... The other thing is too, like we said, like this doesn't, this isn't real. This is exaggerated. This is exaggerated. But if you remember, I, I was a kid then, but Data used to listen to music. He listened to Mozart, mm -hmm. right, on the computer. That was completely out of the realm of reality and possibility when that aired. Nobody thought you'd ever be able to do that. We don't remember that now because we all have iPods mm -hmm. and iPhones and Android phones that do it from the cloud or from a streaming service. But when that aired, you would have had to have. Uh, I watched the show. It was something like 37 discs, uh, floppy disks. And I hate the term floppy disk because they were hard disks. Yeah. Floppy they disks started was a floppy, floppy I, though. I know they did, but nobody knows that anymore. Everyone, Because the save icon is the hard disk. Yeah. But everyone just says floppy disk for that. And I actually remember the big floppy, floppy disks. I yes. remember them from my first and, year uh, of primary school. 
Yeah, five point five. Yeah, and then five, they went to three point five. Five by five. Yeah. I, I was I was a super nerd too, and then they went down to three point fives, and those were hard disks. Yeah. yeah. But then they started calling it a hard disk drive, so the hard disks became floppy disks. Then I Omega came out with a zip disk, which looked like a hard disk but was bigger. Uh, it's so confusing. <laughs> but anyway. At the time, you would have needed 37, 35, 30 something floppy disks to play Mozart. So you'd have to constantly change it. But TNG's, uh, the enterprise um, computers could just hold this information and play it back. The guy who invented that, uh, the guy who invented QuickTime did so because he saw it on TNG. Wow. There was an episode, it was either on the History Channel or Discovery Channel. I don't remember which one. Um, it was something, the name was, I saw it years ago, but it was something like uh, Science That Trek Invented or something like that, right? It was all these things that didn't exist, but that now do exist because people were influenced by the show to figure these things out. The guy who saw that, he he didn't just invent QuickTime. He invented it because he remembers Data listening to it. So who right. knows? Maybe there are theoretical physicists thinking about things like warp mm. drives. And um, one of the things I remember watching was... Be, you don't move the ship, you move space around the ship, hence the warp yeah. part. It was also on that show, but and I saw it other places. But those are the kind of things that people get inspired by here. So while we think it's a, a bit ridiculous and it'll never happen, that may not be true. In the terms of evolution, 1986, right? Which well, When was the first episode of TNG? 86? 87. 87, sorry. I was still a wee lad at the time. Um, but... That, those episodes with Mozart probably aired in 88 or 89. Well, it's only 2019, and we now have every song we could ever think of in our pocket. Mm-hmm. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen next? And that that's the biggest takeaway for me with all of this. Oh, well, yeah, there's probably no subspace. There's probably no space whales. <laughs> okay. But it, I've, I've now learned that you can never say never yeah. to anything. So, Nicholas, uh, where can people find you on the internet if they want to interact with uh, you? Right. Well, I um, so uh, I'm on the network. You'll see me in there commenting on various things. I'm also on uh, Twitter, which is uh, at punkzoologist. Uh, I tend to tweet a lot about, um, uh, often about my uh, work and my PhD and just sort of general sciencey things. And I also have a an Instagram. I am punk rock zoologist on that uh and that is usually uh photos of uh cool bugs that i find or uh sort of field work that i do or um little scale models and little mini figurines that i paint it's been fun talking about the biology of discovery today but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network so here's a quick look at some of the things you may have missed elsewhere on trek fm previously on trek.fm earl gray but just really in a most passionate way he could, in a compassionate manner, he, he goes to him, you are not alone. We're here to help you to do this together. And that means so much to me. Like, you know, I guess being being the youngest kid in the family, so I kind of think, you know, that like you, you don't want to be left out. So, you know, that feeling where no one's listening to, but to see Picard really reach out to him and he wants to help him with all his might. But but there's just that there, there's that divide with him not being able to speak or hear. Melodic treks. Eventually, you know, it, it the s- screen goes to white, and then you cut to uh, Ripley's ship that, that's been derelict for fifty-seven years, and there's this very lonesome-sounding string melody that's playing, and I don't think it's a direct lift, but it's it's certainly very very similar to a piece by um, Aram Kachaturian. Uh, it's from a piece a suite of music called the Gain ballet suite and it's an adagio the edge a star trek discovery podcast no that we say goodbye to everybody this season like anyone who walked off the bridge like if you had to go take a leak they would like all stand up and say goodbye it was like pathetic the orb maybe we all need to be comfortable with that discomfort of hearing something that's different from what we think. So instead of attacking, instead of pushing back immediately, we could just let it go, we could say nothing, or we could respond with, hmm, that's interesting. That's not how I see it, but I didn't think about it that way either. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. 
Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, YouTube, Windows Phone, and most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place is to join the larger conversation in the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select the edge that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. So Patrick, where can people find you when you are not in a metamorphosis stage? Oh, well, when that's not happening, which seems to be happening more and more lately, um, you can find me on the Babel conference. I pop in and out of there as often as possible. Uh, my schedule just got a little hectic, so uh, I don't know how much I'll be able to comment here, but I, w- I would like to, and I like discussing with the fans. You can also find me on Twitter at Magic Drop 5. That's uh, no spaces. The five is a digit, not words. And you can always find me coming to you live with uh, Brandon Shamatala, my good friend at Warp 5 here on the network. So, Amy, where can people reach you when you're not setting up a conservation center for... Uh, Gormaganders. Oh, I need to do that. Let's get that going. We're going to go fund me. <laughs> well, when I am not doing that, I am hosting Earl Grey, which is about the next generation. And listeners, if you're still listening, I talked about uh, the episode in Earl Grey where we talked about um, all of the spacefaring creatures. And that is, I've looked it up, Earl Grey, episode 241, entitled, This One Freaks Me Out. So you can go and check out that and talk. We talk about all about the space creatures in the next generation. I am also on the Fandom Podcast Network talking the Orville on uh, Discoville. And it's the Orville and Discovery. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson, and I am, of course, tag me there on the Babel Conference. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron on the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And in honor of our amazing guest, Nick Collison, I would like to thank our protosociate sapiens, I totally made that up. I totally did. They are Norman Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Puleo, Lisa Slack, Joab Mirza, Richard Rutledge, James Muldrow, Cornelia Reutner. <laughs> Sorry, listener. I've got Nick laughing at me. <laughs> okay. Ryan Mallet, Chris Trebuzio, Brian Malosh. Thank you so much for supporting Trek FM and The Edge. Thank you for listening and join us next time to see what's happening on the edge of Federation space. Space.